Welcome to Full Spectrum Science. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about mixing color. I'll bet your grade school teacher told you that the primary colors were red, yellow, and blue. We're going to find out why that teacher was not paying attention in physics class. But first, we're going to talk about waves, and we're going to get some of the jargon under our belt about waves. Light is an electromagnetic wave, a wave of changing electric and magnetic fields that moves through space at nature's speed limit, 186,282 miles per second, or about 300,000 kilometers per second. Nothing moves faster. Galileo was one of the first to attempt to measure the speed of light. He did this by measuring the distance between two hilltops. Galileo sent his assistant to the far hilltop with a shuttered lantern. Galileo stood on the nearer hilltop with an identical lantern. The plan was for Galileo to open the shutter on his lamp and then for his assistant to open the shutter of his lamp as soon as he saw the light from Galileo's. Using his pulse for timing, there were no clocks yet, Galileo planned to measure the time the light took to travel back and forth between the two hills. If he knew the time and the distance, he could figure out the speed of light. He had no idea how fast light traveled, or that his experiment was doomed to failure only because he lacked the technology. Galileo concluded that the speed of light was, if not instantaneous, it is extraordinarily rapid, and that's a valid scientific statement. Galileo failed because the speed of light is so unbelievably fast. Consider for a moment that light can travel around the Earth more than seven times in one second. What you see here is a proper scale model of the Earth-Moon system. Both Earth and Moon are properly sized and they're the correct distance from one another. It took the Apollo astronauts three days to reach the Moon in their tiny capsule. It takes light 1.3 seconds to cover the same distance. Did you miss that? Let me do it again. 1.3 seconds. Light takes only eight minutes to travel from the sun to the earth. Here you see an amazing high-tech movie of a pulse of laser light moving through a slightly milky water solution in a plastic bottle. Note that this normally takes less than a billionth of a second to happen, and that the pulse of laser light is less than a tenth of a billionth of a second long. Light takes about a billionth of a second, a nanosecond, to travel one foot. This is really a composite movie of many pulses of laser light. They send a pulse, wait for a short time, and take a photo. They send another pulse, wait a little longer, and take another photo. They continue to send pulses, increasing the wait time and taking more photos. Then, the photos are assembled into a movie, like the one you're watching right now. Absolutely incredible. Another jargon word we need to understand is frequency. The frequency is simply the number of wiggles per second that something is vibrating. The unit of frequency is the hertz, abbreviated HZ, after Heinrich Hertz, who discovered radio waves. If something is vibrating at 10 hertz, it's vibrating 10 times per second. The left dot has a lower frequency, the middle dot a medium frequency, and the right dot a higher frequency. You may be familiar with hertz if you're old enough to have listened to your music on one of these. Kids, this is called a radio. If you look at the right end of the scales, you'll see that AM radio is measured in KHZ, or kilohertz, thousands of vibrations per second, and FM is measured in MHZ, or megahertz, millions of vibrations per second. Here, 
We're talking about the frequency of the radio wave carrying the musical information. If the wave vibrates slowly, the peaks and troughs of the wave are further apart. Vibrating quickly brings the peaks and troughs closer together. If you measure the distance from peak to peak, or trough to trough, you'll get a distance called the wavelength. Here, you see the red wave has twice the wavelength of the violet wave. If we played these two waves on a piano, the red wave might sound like this. And the violet wave would sound like this, an octave apart. As a matter of fact, red and violet light wavelengths and frequencies are about an octave apart. We can see an octave of light. All light waves travel at the same speed, the speed of light. That means that the slower vibrating light, red, produces long wavelength waves, and faster vibrating light, blue and violet, produce shorter wavelength waves. There's a simple, direct, and proportional relationship between the frequency and the wavelength. Long wave visible light is red. As you shorten the wavelength, you'll proceed through the visible spectrum from red to orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and finally, violet. The easy way to remember the colors in order is to remember the name, Roy G. Biv, an acronym for the colors. Indigo is thrown in there because we needed the vowel, otherwise it would just be Roy G. Biv. This is a photo of light-sensitive cells on the retina of your eye, taken with an electron microscope. The photo is actually black and white. The retina contains two types of light-sensitive cells, low-light sensors called rods, here seen colored green, and color-sensitive sensors called cones, here colored magenta. In humans, there are three types of cones, each corresponding to a different range of colors. Here, they're labeled S for short wavelength, M for medium wavelength, and L for long wavelength. The S cones cover the blue and violet end of the visible spectrum. The M cones correspond to the middle or greenish range, and the L cones correspond to the reddish end of the spectrum. If you could combine the three sensitivities of the three types of cones, this is the result. We are very sensitive in the green part of the spectrum and much less sensitive in the red and blue-violet parts of the spectrum. We probably evolved this way because this is pretty much the amount of each color light that the sun produces. We most efficiently use what the sun makes the most of. That makes a lot of sense. Just because our human perception only covers red to violet, that doesn't mean that other species perceive the same thing. Birds have a somewhat wider range, and dogs substantially less range with virtually no red perception. You might see a nice juicy raw steak like this, but your pooch may see something more like this. Remember, however, that Fido has a much better sense of smell than you do, making up for the deficit. <coughs> there are two basic types of color mixing. Additive mixing, when we start with nothing and add color, like in light, and subtractive mixing, where we usually start out with white and then take colors away, like in painting and printing. Let's look at additive color mixing first. These are the three primary colors in additive mixing, red, green, and blue. These roughly correspond to the three types of cone receptors in your eye. James Clerk Maxwell, who famously came up with the equations we use to describe the laws of electromagnetism, including light, is seen here in his earlier years. He came up with the rules of additive color mixing. You can see in his hand a top that he could spin with colors on it that would then combine from the motion. He's known as the father of additive color. He also took the very first color photograph, which you see here. 
of a colorful tartan ribbon. The lengthy process he went through to produce this color image is interesting. He put his ribbon, I'm using a bow, in front of three cameras. In front of the camera lenses, he placed three filters, red, green, and blue. He then took three photos. The camera with the red filter only captured the red light from the ribbon. The camera with the green filter only captured the green parts of the ribbon. And the blue filtered camera only the blue parts of the ribbon. Note the differences in the photos. This was way before color film, so Maxwell caught these images in black and white on clear glass plates. Again, note the differences. He put these plates back into the cameras, got rid of the original ribbon, and replaced it with a screen, and placed three light sources behind the photo plates, making the cameras into slide projectors. With the filters still in place, he projected the red, green, and blue images of the ribbon back on the screen where the ribbon appeared in full color. When making a paper copy, he colored the three images appropriately. Let's look at a modern application of this same method. Most satellite and astronomical images, including Hubble images, are taken the same way as separate black and white images photographed through different filters. These black and white photos are then assigned colors and then composited back together to make those beautiful photos. Here, the ring nebula in Lyra the harp. Remember the three primary colors are red, green, and blue. Let's add colors. Add green and blue, and where they overlap, you get a turquoise color we call cyan. Cyan equals blue plus green. Add red and blue, and where they overlap, you make magenta. Magenta is red plus blue. The only other combination is adding red to green. Red plus green makes yellow? This may seem like a surprise to many people, but we're mixing light here, not paint. We'll get to paint in a bit. Finally, when you mix all three colors of light, where they all overlap in the center, you get white. Red plus green plus blue makes white. Let's review our additive color mixing. Our primary colors are red, green, and blue. Blue and green make cyan. Red and blue make magenta. Red and green make yellow. And finally, all three primaries, when mixed together, make white. Colors opposite each other, red and cyan, green and magenta, blue and yellow, are called complementary colors. When you add complementary colors, you get white. Depending on how much of each color you add, you can make just about any color, like in this RGB color cube. Diagonally opposite corners of the cube are complementary. Red is diagonally opposite its complement, cyan. Green is opposite its complement, magenta. And blue is opposite yellow. Also, white and black are diagonally opposite each other. If you're a computer geek like me, this cube is 16 by 16 by 16 colors for a total of 4,096 colors, and this would be called 4-bit color because 2 to the 4th power is 16. Most people work in 8-bit color, which would have 256 by 256 by 256 cubes, or 16,777,216 colors. Now, I can't display that kind of detail here. I don't have enough pixels on the screen to draw it. But it might look something like this. Unfortunately, you can't see inside this cube where most of the colors reside. However, the six faces of the cube you are seeing display 393,216 colors, or 
256 by 256 on each face times six faces. Pretty hypnotic. Let's look at some examples of additive color. Your TV or the computer monitor you're watching right now have red, green, and blue phosphors or filters arranged in tiny, almost invisible spots or bars. Look closely and you'll see something like either of these photos. Televisions and monitors can really only make red, green, and blue. Your view from a distance combines the three primaries into the multitude of colors you perceive. The first projection TVs had three separate red, green, and blue projection tubes. Many laser projectors today are made with three lasers, red, green, and blue. The three beams are combined into a white beam with special mirrors. By changing the brightness of the three lasers, you can make any color beam on the output. Move the beams around while you do this, and you have a laser show. Like this. I'd like to thank Christopher Short for that little segment. He's a great laserist. <clears throat> now, fluorescent lamps also depend on adding colors. If you remove the powder from the inside of a fluorescent tube so the glass is clear, you'll see the baby blue glowing colors of mercury gas. If you break apart the colors with a prism or diffraction gratings, you'll see this. The lamp is on the left and the colors it makes, the spectrum, is on the right. Notice the individual pure colors making up this baby blue, namely yellow, very bright green, and a bright violet. You don't see some other very bright ultraviolet colors also given off by the mercury because they're invisible to us, but they're very important. The powders on the inside surface of a regular fluorescent tube is a combination of phosphors like these. They glow when hit by the ultraviolet light of the excited mercury. The colors of the phosphors produce and combine to make the white light of the lamp. If you look at its spectrum, you'd still see the yellow, green, and violet light from mercury, but also the light from the phosphors that fill in the spectrum to make white light. You can get multicolor LEDs too. They really contain three LEDs each and have four wires, one each for the red, green, and blue LED and the fourth wire for the common wire. The top left movie shows the RGB LED from above as the LEDs are changing brightness. And the bottom right movie shows the same LED from the side. By varying brightnesses, you can make any color with these LEDs. Now let's talk about subtractive color mixing. Paint is an example of subtractive mixing. You start with a white canvas or palette like you see here. All colors are reflecting from the surface. Add paint of a certain color and only that color reflects from the canvas. You had to subtract something from the white to get the color. When you add complementaries, you get white. When you take away colors from white, you get complementary colors. If you take red away from white, you get its complement, cyan. Take green away from white, and you get green's complement, magenta. And just to complete the set, if you take blue from white light, you're left with blue's complement, yellow. This idea of taking away colors will lead us nicely to subtractive color mixing. The primary colors for subtractive color mixing are cyan, magenta, and yellow. Let me put up that RGB mixing chart from a few slides back as a reminder. Remember, you get cyan by taking red away from white. You get magenta 
by taking green away from white, and yellow by taking away blue. Now what happens when we mix these colors? Each one takes away something from white. If we mix magenta and yellow, the magenta subtracts green from white, and the yellow subtracts blue from white. Subtract green and blue from white, and the only color left is red. That's what we get. Let's see what the other combinations give us. Let's mix cyan and yellow. Cyan subtracts red, and yellow subtracts blue. Take away red and blue from white, and the only color left is green. Only one more combination left. Let's combine cyan and magenta. Again, cyan subtracts red, and magenta subtracts green. I'm sure you're already predicting that the result we're going to get is blue, and you'd be right. What happens when we mix all three together? Cyan plus magenta plus yellow is the same as taking away red, green, and blue. When you take away all three, you get, not surprisingly, black. Note that this is the complement of the little reminder chart in the lower left. I understand it's confusing at first, so let's review subtractive color mixing again. Our primary subtractive colors are cyan, magenta, and yellow. Mix magenta and yellow, and we get red. Mix cyan and yellow, and we get green. Cyan and magenta make blue. And all together, everything mixes to black. Like the RGB additive color mixing, you can add different amounts of cyan, magenta, and yellow to create any color. And again, complementary colors are opposite each other, like before. Remember your primary school teacher? He or she probably confused cyan, magenta, and yellow for blue, red, and yellow as the paint primaries. Now you know better. Let's see it happen in real life. Okay, let's try to mix some of those subtractive color primaries in real life. By the way, I failed to mention at the top of the show that I'm wearing my color mixing shirt. You can see that the horizontal and my vertical stripes are all mixing to the different colors. Let's get back to the liquid color that we have here. I'm using liquid watercolor for these. If you're doing this at home, you can try using, um, if you have uh, those printer inks that you refill your cartridges with, you'll have cyan, magenta, and yellow ink. I don't use the ink because it's a little bit more messy and stains everything, but these liquid watercolors work really well. Let's get right into it. Let's mix, say, magenta and yellow first. So I've got my magenta color here. I'm going to put a few drops in this beaker. Magenta takes green light away from white. Let's stir it up so we can see the magenta. That's really pretty. And now let's add yellow to that. Yellow takes blue away from white light. Remember, we've already taken green away from white light. Now we're taking blue away from white light. Let's see what the result is. Okay, and now let's mix it together. I think you can already see what's going to happen. Magenta plus yellow gives us red because we've taken away green and we've taken away blue. The only thing left is red. Let's try another one. Let's move this one off to the side. Got a new beaker of water here. And now let's mix cyan and yellow. Cyan takes away red from white light. Don't need much of that, it's pretty rich. Let's mix that in. Got a nice cyan color there. And now we're going to add to that yellow. Yellow takes away blue, so we've taken away red. We're going to take away blue. What's the only thing left? I think you can probably guess what this is going to be. And there we go. Take away red, take away blue. The only thing left is green. Let's move that off to the side. And let's move in another beaker here, because we have one more combination we haven't tried yet. We want to try mixing cyan and magenta. So here we go. Cyan 
takes away what? Cyan takes away red. Put a little cyan in there. So we've taken away red, which gives us cyan. And now we're going to mix in magenta. Magenta takes away green. So we've taken away red, and now we're going to take away green. And what are we going to be left with? Here we go. Let me mix it. I think you can probably, again, figure this one out for yourself as well. Take away red, take away green, and you're left with blue. So here we have the complementary colors, the subtractive primaries. When you mix them together, they mix together into the additive primaries. Isn't that interesting? What happens if we mix everything together? Well, let me bring a slightly bigger container in, and I'm going to mix together the blue and the red and the green. Stir them all together, and I think you can already see what's happened here. If you take away all the colors, you're left with black. So let's continue with our color talk now. Similar to the demos I just did, I want to quickly mention an art piece we recently hosted in our black box gallery. This was a piece called Kaleidoscope by artist Karina Smigla Bobinski. Karina used thick, flat, clear bags of cyan, magenta, and yellow dyes all on top of one another. Pressing and changing the thickness of each color produced this amazingly colorful piece. Here's a close-up of three similar pouches to the side of the main exhibit where people could play with them individually. It was a beautiful example of an art piece that utilized subtractive color mixing. A real-world example of subtractive color mixing is color printing. Next time you get a newspaper, notice this little square from the front page. See the test colors? Here, you see the primaries, cyan, magenta, and yellow, and the colors that result from mixing them. The printer monitors this array of colors to make sure the printing process produces the correct amount of each color. Printing a color photo means starting off with something called a color separation. Here, you see the Mona Lisa broken into the cyan, magenta, and yellow colors of the original. I'll explain the black color separation in a moment. The paper gets printed four times with the subtractive primaries to make a full color print. First, we'll print cyan. Next, we'll overlay the magenta. We're seeing a very limited range of colors now. Next, we'll print the yellow image. We pretty much see a full color image now, but it's kind of muddy and lacks contrast and punch. Inks, they're not perfect. Adding cyan, magenta, and yellow ink won't give you a rich black. This is where the last black image comes in. Add it in, and we see the Mona Lisa in all her glory. This is the basis of four-color printing. You may have heard it referred to as CMYK processing. The letters stand for the colors, cyan, magenta, and yellow. They didn't use B for black because it might be confused with blue. Rather, the K was used because this is the key color. Just in case you don't trust the computerized version I just showed you, I have a real-world color separation right here. This has the cyan, magenta, and yellow-black color separations. First, I'm going to add the cyan version. This is the Palace of Fine Arts, our previous home. I'm now going to add the magenta version. Now you're beginning to see a little color. Let's add yellow, which should give us a more or less full color image, except for the fact that they don't add together to a really good uh, black. So we have to add that last black separation in, and there we see the full color image of the Palace of Fine Arts, our original home. Look inside your inkjet printer. You'll find four cartridges, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, just like you might expect. 
If you check out inside of your color laser copier or printer, you'll find our now familiar CMYK cartridges. A fun example of color subtraction are the colors seen in bubbles, like here in the soap film painting exhibit in the Exploratorium. Notice you're not seeing the familiar Roy G. Biv spectrum. You're seeing its complement. We'll get to that. It's easier to see if we have a simple bubble hoop. The colors in a bubble are created by light interference. Different colors are canceled or subtracted from the reflected light depending on the thickness of the soap film. Seen from the side, it might look like this, highly exaggerated. Held vertically, the bubble drains, so the top of the bubble is much thinner than the bottom of the bubble. About here, the bubble is the right thickness to cancel out blue light, which has a short wavelength. White minus blue is yellow. A little further down, the bubble is a bit thicker, canceling green light. White minus green is magenta. A bit lower, and the still thicker bubble cancels yellow. White minus yellow appears blue. And a bit lower, the thickness of the film cancels red, making the bubble look cyan. White minus red is cyan. The pattern repeats when multiple wavelengths cancel colors. Bubble colors make a topological map of the thickness of the bubble. Here's our typical Roy G. Biv spectrum. The inverse complementary spectrum looks like this. Every color in the top spectrum is opposite its complement in the bottom spectrum. The colors in the bottom spectrum are the colors we see in a bubble film. Since they are complementary colors, if we overlap the two spectra, all the colors should add to white. And they do. Here's a chart of the bubble colors with the corresponding thickness along the bottom. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. Again, the spectral pattern repeats with multiple wavelengths as they cancel. The black and white areas on the left side is a whole topic that we don't have time for during this talk. Maybe we'll do a whole full spectrum science on bubbles in the future. The same colors are seen on the street after a rain. A drop of oil or gasoline creates a bubble-thin layer on the pavement, resulting in beautiful subtractive interference colors. Let's do a little experiment with complementary colors in your eye. Everyone is familiar with these colors. What would a complementary flag look like? Well, like this. Yellow is the complement of blue, cyan is the complement of red, and black is well, sort of the complement of white. Now stare at the white dot in the middle of the flag for about 30 seconds. You will cause some of the cones in your eye to become fatigued. The cyan stripes will tire your green and blue cones, but not the red cones. Keep staring at the dot. The yellow will tire your red and green cones, but not the blue cones. Keep staring at the dot. I'm about to switch to a plain gray background. You'll perceive the flag in its proper colors in the after image, which will be the complementary colors of these. Ready? Here we go. Three, two, one. You see it? If you blink, you can refresh the after image. You're seeing complementary images due to fatigued cones in the retina of your eye. How cool is that? Here are some exhibits in the Exploratorium where you can explore color mixing. At Chromoscope, you can mix intensities of red, green, and blue transparencies to see the result and even swap around the colors. Of course, Everyone knows the colored shadow wall, lit by red, green, and blue lamps, shadows in cyan, magenta, and yellow appear. The colored shadow investigator 
lets you explore the effects in the colored shadow wall in a bit more detail. Bob Miller's Distilled Light allows you to take white light apart into the primaries and put them back together again into white light. The Pixel Table from our Tinkering Studio is another example of playing with colored shadows. Bob Miller's Aurora lets you combine colors coming through colored filters, reflecting them from a curved, reflective surface above. Countless Colors allows you to mix various amounts of red, green, and blue light and see the result. An almost identical exhibit, Countless Colors Cube, also plays with red, green, and blue combinations. Newton's Prisms lets you do the same experiment that Isaac Newton performed, breaking up light into a spectrum and recombining it back to white light. Lastly, recognize this? It's projected on the floor in front of the sun painting on cloudy days and at night during after dark. That about wraps it up for this episode of Full Spectrum Science about mixing color. This program, like all exploratorium programs, is only possible because of donors like you. If you can, help us keep educational content like this free and accessible to all by donating today at www.exploratorium.edu give. Thank you.